What's up, guys? My name is Miles. And my name is Fez. And this is The Commodity. And today, by widely popular request, we are finally doing Geography Now Singapore Reaction. Yeah, I, I think the reason we held off on it for so long is because it's almost a 30-minute video. Yeah. <laughs> So, and honestly, our, our Singapore videos didn't start popping off until recently. Yeah, in the last um, few days. And so we're really happy that, that they are. And we're really happy that you guys want to see more. So before we hop in, if you will, go ahead and give this video a like. It'll definitely help us out in getting this video out to more people. Also, if you could, click the subscribe button and the bell notification icon if you guys want to see more videos like this. And if you'd like to help support the channel out even more, you can click the join button down below. So let's go ahead and hop in. Let's do it. All right, Singapore. If any of you guys saw my older videos, you'll know I had the amazing experience of visiting this country a couple years ago. My Singaporean friends, Nigel, Ben, and Kevin will be appearing again in this episode. I will say, I get why Singapore is such an internationally renowned hotspot. It's a small country with big ambition. It went from a few dilapidated wooden stilt homes and boating fishermen. Dilapidated. I heard that word for the first time about an hour ago. Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> do you know what it means? Yes. Okay. Now I do. Now you do. Literally a boat on top of three skyscrapers. Either way, one thing's for sure. Singapore definitely isn't Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Is it my turn? <laughs> it's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host. Now I was told that uh, on a few of the, our comments on the videos that we've posted up uh, that are taking off is Singapore the country is very expensive mm -hmm. not rich so the people there they're like we're not rich we're scraping by we survive because we're resilient but it's hard to live there yeah no. because I think it's more designed for people with wealth to come and visit Right. Not for the people that live there. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I've been reading a lot lately. So. Barbs, welcome to the Jewel of Asia, the only place in the world to have gotten their independence against their will. We'll get into that later. But one <laughs> thing you can do on your own will is get a Geography Now mug or t-shirt or drawstring bag at geographynow.com. It's not selling out if it's my brand. Oh, sh In any case, get ready because we're about to look that's at the globe cool and logo. find this gem yeah. of a nation in three, two... Singapore or Pulau Ujong. Anyway, it's the world's Ujong. only island city state. Something is clearly happening here. So let's go to the globe. First of all, the country is located in Southeast Asia, just at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. To the west, you have the Strait of Malacca, and to the south and east, you have the Riau Islands of Indonesia. Singapore is made up of one main island, Singapore, which makes up about 95% of the country's landmass, as well as 63 other smaller satellite islands and islets. Mm. More are actually set to come, as they do extensive land reclamation projects, creating new artificial islands. In fact, to this day, Singapore has actually increased its landmass by 22% since independence wow. through land wow. reclamation. Yeah. In fact, if you look over here at the Tuas Peninsula, you can even see it is currently being reclaimed every day and is set for completion by 2030. That's over here, insane. Jurong Island was actually a merger of seven previous islands reclaimed into one and is now used as an industrial complex. Besides Singapore Island, though, only two other islands are residentially inhabited. Pulau U Seems like eventually you won't be an island anymore yeah. if you keep on going <laughs> that route. Bean and Sentosa Island. Otherwise, the rest are used for other purposes like the military, laboratories, wildlife sanctuaries, and so on. Now, the country doesn't exactly have any official administrative divisions, but when it comes to building sections, there are five development councils that cluster communities together, mostly for government housing projects. When elections come up, though, they do have group and single member constituency neighborhoods. These areas are allotted a certain number of seats in parliament so as to allow a somewhat balanced representation of people groups in the country. Although That's the good. country is only about 725 square kilometers in size making it the 20th smallest country in area they actually have a lot of air transport 20th smallest country i thought it would be higher up on that list yeah but i guess there's a lot of small countries 19 That's crazy. other smaller countries they have seven military airports and airstrips and two public airports yes two everyone thinks singapore's changi international voted the best airport in the world for several consecutive years in a row is mm. the only one but if you go just 16 kilometers north you'll find this hidden little guy selatar airport it operates flights to indonesia and malaysia as well as private flights and a flight training school otherwise the country has an incredibly complex and highly operational network of roads rail lines and shipping docks there are two bridges that can 
connect to Malaysia over the Johor Strait. You have the busiest one going into the city of Johor Bahru at the Johor Causeway Bridge in the north. I've and then you have the second bridge link bridge busy. toll road yeah. that enters into the west side. People usually take this road to go to Legoland, Malaysia. After Shanghai, Legoland. Singapore has the world's second largest shipping container port, able to transport nearly 40 million containers annually. From wow. there, many other commercial ports are used for the public, like the Harbor Front Center and the Marina Bay Cruise Center. That probably has a lot to do with why there is so much money with Singapore, though. Yeah. The yeah. world's second largest. Yeah. That's insane. Now you can't talk about Singapore without mentioning the MRT, the oldest, busiest, and most costly rail system in Southeast Asia. It also has the longest driverless network in the world and some of the deepest subway tunnels in the world. And finally, That's fun cool. fact, yeah. Christmas Island and the Cocos and Keeling Islands were at one point a part of Singapore under British rule, but then were transferred to Australia in 1957. For real though, the airport is so cool. So, that going back beautiful. to infrastructure, Singapore is kind of internationally renowned for having very strict laws when it comes to things like car and home ownership. Basically, all cars are required to have an IU or in-vehicle unit, a device that's installed in the windshield and is basically a prepaid account that has money deducted from it when you drive under the ERP toll pass. We've seen things like that in the Malaysian built, vehicles, yeah, right? Yeah, built directly into yeah. the cars, which on top of it's is not crazy. a bad idea. No, though. not that owning a car is pretty difficult enough as it is. Here is Ben to explain. Um, the government highly advocates for the use of public transportation like the buses and the metro system, which in Singapore we call the, we call the MRT. And on top of that, in order to regulate um, the number of car owners and the number of cars on the road, in Singapore, if one wants to buy a car, we not only have to pay for the car itself, we have to pay for the certificate of entitlement. And that certificate, that piece of paper can go up to $30,000 and that $30,000 wow. actually varies according to the season because what happens is this COE of the goals by a balloting system and this COE lasts for a period of 10 years after 10 years you have the option of renewing the COE for another five years or you have to scrape the car and get a new car and get another new COE for another 10 years so ta -da -da, that's a crazy unfortunate. rich agent and Ben, about home ownership, explain. How does it work in Singapore? I wonder if that's the same concept as what we do with our registration. I don't know. Because we pay tax. That's, that's a tax. Well, but he counted that in, in dollars. Yeah, I know. But that's I mean, expensive. Yeah, 30000 <laughs> But if you think about it, if it, he said up to 30000 So that could be literally buying like a Lamborghini. Right. So if we bought a Lamborghini, I'm sure after 10 years... We'll be spending tens of thousands of dollars yeah. on registration on a Lamborghini. So I, I think it all kind of equals out. Mm -hmm. Singapore, what's the HDB? Go. If I am not wrong, I think 90% of the land here in Singapore belongs to the country. Wow. HDB is in charge of building apartments, build apartment buildings for um, most Singaporeans to live in. So about 80% of the Singaporean populations and these flats or these apartments um we may say that we own it but technically it's a lease for 99 years but considering that the country isn't even 99 years old in itself nobody quite knows exactly <laughs> what a completion of lease would look like wow yeah. and that is how we manage to you know keep everyone sheltered thank you ben this means housing operates easier and faster because you don't have to worry about red tape issues like department approval or ordinance laws basically the point of real estate in singapore is you buy to live not really to invest yeah you will never see one of those hgtv flipper shows airing <laughs> here in any case time to move on to the famous places mm. segment the fountain of wealth orchard road has like the best shopping chinatown with the street market and oh, buddha tooth dope. relic temple and that museum temple. kampong glam with haji lane and the sultan mosque little india with the mustafa center and the sri Vir Makaliaman Temple, Halpar Villa, Universal Studios, the Night Safari, the Henderson Waves, Jurong Bird Park, wow. Marina Bay Sands, and the rooftop Infinity Pool. So many museums, cemeteries, and art galleries, and probably the most iconic landmark, the Gardens Garden by, by the, the bay, bay, with the super trees and the cloud forest and flower dome. Yeah, those super trees are really cool. I was lucky enough to see them when I visited. It's crazy how much Singapore puts an emphasis on coalescing concrete with nature, which brings us to... That is crazy because that's that's now, very. Singapore common. gets its name from the word Singapore. Do what? So that is crazy because that's that's the concept that you know I see in a lot of places in Singapore is like a modernized but still green city. Right, I agree. Singapore derived from Sanskrit meaning Lion City even though there's no lions here. Nobody knows exactly why it's called Singapore then, but the more popular theory comes from the Malay annals claiming that this guy sailed here and in the 13th century it was like, 
Whoa, I think I see a lion. Is that a lion? No, <laughs> there are no lions in this part of the world. That must have been a tiger. No, nope, too late. I already saw it. I already made up my mind. Singapore. So yeah, that's basically <laughs> it. In any case, for Singapore, with limited space comes limited environmental responsibility. Here's the uh, motion graphic. First of all, as the country is heavily urbanized, Singapore has lost about 90% of its historical forests, and the majority of what's left is found either in the Sungai Bulo wetland or the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve and the surrounding green areas in the center of the main island. Speaking of which, here you can find the highest point, Bukit Timah Hill, at about 163 meters tall. This notable area in the center of the country has the most well-known freshwater reservoirs that supply the inhabitants of the country, like the McRitchie Reservoir, the Central Water Catchment, and the Upper Selatar Reservoir. However, it is this one, the Lower Pierce Reservoir, that is the source of the longest river of the country, the Kalang River, which is more like a controlled still creek flowing about 10 kilometers down to the largest body of fresh water, the Marina Bay Reservoir, which is actually fed by five rivers. This reservoir alone supplies about 10% of the country's freshwater needs. It wow. started in 2008 with salt water, but then in two years, they desalinated and drained the remaining salt water. The freshwater bay is contained from the saltwater sea only by a narrow dam called the Marina Barrage, only about 10 meters wide. It would be very bad if that dam was to mess up. Yeah. For 10% wow. of the population. Yeah. Yeah. Mind, this guy over here, the Pandan Reservoir to the west, contains more water and surface area, but the water is non-potable and is used to service the industrial sector. As the hmm. island only lies about one and a half degrees north of the equator, they have a tropical rainforest climate with relative uniform temperatures throughout the year. However, for nine months of the year, they experience two monsoon seasons between November to March and June to September. Somewhere On top down. of that, they have Somewhere an average 84.2 yeah. humidity level, and it's not uncommon to go up to 100%, especially on rainy wow. days. Yep, well, we're used rainy. to that. Yeah. There's even a saying, by the rain, by the sweat, either way, you will get wet. It's like <laughs> Florida. I'm like Florida man, I think. Yes, Keith, you you are Florida man. For what it's worth, though, <laughs> as the country becomes more urban and developed, they are trying to preserve as much nature as they can, which is kind of a challenge. I mean, it's like skyscrapers coming up everywhere. What are you going to do? One very creative way they've been doing so is through the tactic of fusing their concrete and steel foundations with living hedges of flora. What the hell am I doing with my hands? To explain more, <laughs> guess who's back? Noah! <laughs> How about that? I'm back. Let's get to it. With Singapore, the very continuity of their country depends on balance. Uh, so that was a oh, to that's beautiful vertical too. Greenery and as much space as they can. You can see this in many places like the Oasia Hotel downtown, which literally has vines growing all over the grill exterior. In addition, there actually are a few small plots of land designated for agriculture, mostly in the northwest quadrant of the country. Here, there are over 2,000 farms, averaging about two and a half acres each. Nonetheless, they invest heavily in the finance, technology, business, and service sector. The country puts a huge emphasis on encouraging entrepreneurs with free trade policies and easily accessible government grants and funds. They have the third least corrupt economy with low tax rates. In addition, all workers under 55 are required to give 20... Who was it that had the least corrupt? Was that uh, New Zealand? Isn't uh, that what we heard? I think that's what it was. And I think it was also like the easiest uh, company, uh, country to work with. Yeah. For businesses. Yeah. 20% of their wages to the central... Provident Fund, which is a social savings fund like a pension. Employers give 17% of earnings. So long story short, these are some of the main factors that made the country so prosperous so fast. And speaking of fast, here comes our animal correspondent, Gary Harlow. Oh, animal correspondent. Here we are with Puppy Harlow. Roof. <laughs> Now, with a country that's over 90% urbanized, you would think that animals would have no way of thriving here. But you're wrong, and don't you forget it. Because of the climate, <laughs> Singapore is still able to host over 60 mammals, nearly wow. 400 bird species, and about 110 reptiles, 30 amphibians. Most of the animals live in one of the five established nature reserves. Four on the main island, and one on Palawawa. <laughs> <laughs> Pulao Ubin. The most common mammal you'll probably find on a long-tailed macaque monkeys. If you're lucky, you might come across one of the cool. incredibly rare Sunda pangolins that are highly protected. And along certain westland areas, you can find otters. Look at the otters. <laughs> Was that an otter sound? Nonetheless, out of all these real animals, the national animal of the country is the mere lion, a fictional creature that's half lion, half fish. Speaking of legendary creatures, we go back to Noah Gildemaster, the master of guilds. Thanks, Gary. Tell Caleb I say hi. <laughs> and with that, it's the time you hungry people have all been waiting for. Food! Singapore takes food I love seriously. food. Let's put it this way. Some people come into Singapore just for the food. Now, usually I take on this segment, but Singaporean Kevin knows his food. So I'm going to pass this over to him. Kevin, 
Take it away. So over here, we have an incredibly rich history of mixing different flavors from our different people groups. And some of the best places to try this is what we would call a hawker center. A hawker center is hawker basically center. a big food court that's filled with many, many stalls or push carts for people to choose different foods from. Some of these small venues are even Michelin star rated. There are over 107 wow. hawker centers in Singapore, but the largest one is the Chinatown Complex Food Center that houses more than 260 mini stalls. The next time you come to Singapore, you have to try some of our local and try every single one. one you definitely wouldn't run out no <laughs> you, you could try a different one almost every day yeah on on four are laksa chicken rice I like laksa. rojak chakwe tiao hokkien mi chicken clay pot rice chendol ice kacang roti prata murtabak by the way nobody here actually drinks a singapore sling it's basically a touristy gimmick <laughs> thanks kevin yeah lots of fusion with singapore let's discuss more on that in the next segment Shall we? Oh, why, thanks. thank you, Mr. Noah. In the words of fiction writer William Gibson, Singapore is like Disneyland with a death penalty. It's shiny, oh, wow. it's pretty, it's clean, it's efficient, but it does kind of come at a cost of heavy restrictions and somewhat authoritarian and technocratic protocol. This kind of puts Singapore in a weird state of, like, prosperity at the cost of certain societal compromises. It's a hard topic to address because there's so many layers that go into it, and I suggest you just talk to a Singaporean if we want to know more. On top of that, everything kind of functions in four fours clearly you could tell by now there's nothing in here i'm just using it as a prop sad i know we'll get more into that in a bit but first he's like congrats. buy my singapore cup. has a population just under six million and often ranks as the number one or number two spot for the country with the lowest fertility rate on earth with only about 0.9 children per couple wow. it also ranks number one as the most competitive economy Plus on earth cost. with a spot in the top five highest gdp per capita countries as well the largest group of people in the country identify as ethnically chinese but keep in mind this number also includes an undetermined percentage of people that are mixed with chinese like the piranha from there, the next largest group are the Malays, somewhere around 13.5%. Keep in mind, this category also may include Indonesian migrants that register as Malays, though. And the third largest group are the Indians at around 10%, mostly South Tamil and Malayalam-speaking Indians. However, keep in mind, this registered category may also include general Indian subcontinent individuals from other countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. From there, the remainder of the population are other groups, mainly Eurasians, Caucasians, Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos, and Vietnamese. They use the Singapore dollar as their currency, which by the way is pegged and interchangeable with the Brunei dollar. They use the type G plug outlet and they drive on the left side of the road. Remember? Have we done a Singapore dollar video? Mm, no. We should check that out. Yep. We Remember they were once a British territory. The country has four official languages, each pertaining to the main ethnic groups. They are Mandarin, Malay, Tamil, and English. Nobody does this. Why is this a four for me? <laughs> and there's technically a... He's having a tough time with his hands. It's English, which is kind of like an English Creole that mixes all the languages. Okay, here's the guys explaining. So in Singapore, there is a local slang that's called Singlish. And Singlish is basically English that incorporates elements of Chinese or Malay into it. Like la, which we use as an emphasis before or after a sentence. For example, the weather is so hot la. Aya, xiao la. Got so many of these terms you go online and check, okay? I very tired lah. Another way of speaking We've learned about a lot. Yeah. The different languages we have here in the country together. Uncle, we are Ipe Teo Ko Song Beng. So uncle is in English. Wo Yao Ipe is Mandarin. They all go Song Beng. It's a mixture of dialect Hokkien and also the Malay language. Now, when you're buying food in the hawker center and you're not going to be able to eat there and you need to take away, you can tell the uncle that you need to tapao. Uncle, ta bao. one chicken rice please, tapao. Thank you guys. Now, in a way, you can kind of see Singapore as a tri-ethnic or plurinational country. Kind of like Belgium with the Walloons and Flemish or Bosnia and Herzegovina with the Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians. Actually, Bosnia and Herzegovina is not the best example because all three are basically the same thing. But you get the point. And the country is kind of calibrated to preserve this social structure. Like, you're required to register your ethnic group on your papers and passport. This hmm, has been really? kind of like a slight inconvenience for some people of mixed ancestry, like the Peranakan, which are kind of like descendants between Chinese and Malays. And and they're kind of like their own unique people group. However, these days, more people are mixing ethnic lines and giving birth to biracial children. This has led to them adding a mixed race option on paperwork in 2011, which adds a whole new dimension to society. Uh, yeah, here's Nigel explaining a little bit more on that. Today, the four most common languages are English, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil. Now, these languages can be seen on the street signs, advertisements, and public notices. We also have dialects, which are spoken but unwritten languages. Completely off topic, but these designs are bathing ape. Oh, are they? Yeah, the brand that uh, that our friends 
at uh, Motorsports Playground mm -hmm. worked with. Yes, in school, students are taught the importance of racial harmony, and we also have a day which celebrates this diversity. Our history began with the Malays as the first inhabitants, people from China, India, Europe, and other countries. Now he got me looking at him. Yeah. In the early 19th century. When it comes to housing, it's quite natural for people to want to live in a community where their neighbors speak the same language and share the same culture. But to prevent ethnic enclaves, an ethnic quota was implemented for public housing. So a certain ratio is assigned to each block, denominating the percentage of Malays, Chinese, Indians and other races. And by doing this, none of the three major ethnic groups were disadvantaged. Every race is now represented in each neighborhood. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, the racial quota. Unfortunately, this also means depending on your race, it could be easier or harder to buy a home depending on the location. It's kind of like a That's weird thing that nobody really likes to talk about, but everybody knows that race can kind of be used in this way in Singapore. It's it's the way how it is. In any case, all of this is obviously enforced through the government, which is kind of like a tight, semi-autocratic one-party system called the People's Action Party. It has been the dominant party since they forcefully gained independence against their will. That's right, <laughs> after the British left in 1959, they deliberately wanted to unify with Malaysia, but then it was like, seriously, you're imposing a 20% revenue contribution hike on my fiscal input and have imposed the Bumi Putara policy? Pretty sketchy, dude. Well, this is Malay territory and you did want to join our federation. And even after we agreed on a level of autonomy, you still had the nerve to be an indignant little That's not possible. That's no, no, because I, listen, yeah. you, if you, you look at the facts, so the facts. Okay, the that's it. I'm kicking you out. Parliament, vote. No! I just wanted to negotiate different terms! What are you doing? No! No! It is with great sadness that I must announce that our little island has now gained independence. A little exaggerated, but literally Lee Kuan Yew was like sad during his announcement. He was even quoted for saying it was a moment of anguish. But wow. any Huan Hunan, faith-wise, the nation is also quite mixed up as well. The largest group being Buddhists at around a third of the country. Mm. The second largest group is actually Christians at mm. nearly a fifth of the country's population. And from there, Islam comes in at third at about 14% of the country. Rounding out at number four, about 7% are Hindus, mostly from the Indian community. So yeah, that's that. All right, enough from me. In that case, it's now it's time for the sports part. Nothing. Usually art fills in for this segment but he is literally driving back to LA. He's coming home. And uh, as you know, he can't film while he's in a car. So we need a substitute, which means uh, we're going to need someone to come in. I guess it's going to be you, Ian. Ian, hey, fill in for right. the sports part. Sports part with Ian. As a small country I've that never puts heard more a sports of a cultural part, focus on business and finance, sports are you... Huh? I have never heard them do a sports part. Oh, yeah, yeah, have yeah. yeah. I can't think of it, no. Yeah, all the other countries we've done, I, I don't remember them talking about sports. That's cool. Did they? Yeah, no, I don't I don't think they did. I think you're right. Usually pushed off with less of a national priority. Nonetheless, everything from bodybuilding to badminton can be found here competition wise. Their soccer or football team were four time football. winners of the AFF championships. A hey, otherwise you can see native sports too like foot volleyball or sepak takra. Yeah. It's an intense oh, wow. sport. And the martial art salat, native to Indonesia. And we just and learned Asia. about yeah. that too. Done here as, well. as an island nation, though, swimming and water related activities have always been their specialty. Nothing was more glorious for the country when Joseph Schooling was able to not only compete with, but beat the man he looked up to, Michael Phelps, wow. in the 100 meter butterfly event at the 2016 Olympics. We still love you, Michael Phelps. You're awesome. Well, thanks for having Most me. Most Sorry you're not here. Yeah. Good luck driving, uh, but do the speed limit. Thank you, EA. Yeah. For having me. Fly event at the 2016 Olympics. We still love you, Michael. Look at all that gold, though. Yeah. <laughs> I think sacrificing a few is all is okay. Yeah, but not to take away from this guy. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I, I don't want to take away from that guy, but that's ridiculous. Yeah. I, and it's funny. I was looking at the most golds this year mm -hmm. to who it went to, and it's always swimmers. Like, the top five or six are yeah. all swimmers. I guess they can compete in so many events. Mm-hmm. That like it, I, I think a lot were Australian, some were American, and then like I think Chinese and a couple other ones here and there. But Australian wrecked this yeah. year. They did really good this year. Michael Phelps, you're awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Art. Sorry you're not here. Good luck driving. Uh, but do the speed limit. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Uh, anytime. And he hua. The cool thing about Singapore is that the people all kind of bring something to the table that everyone can enjoy on a national level. Enough on that from me, though. It's time to hand the reins over to our culture correspondent, Random Hannah. Party people, it is good to be back. 
Yeah. So as mentioned, Singapore is a diverse country, but there are a few things that kind of unite them all. It's said Singaporeans all have the five great fears. Kia Su, meaning the fear of missing out, FOMO. Mm. Kia Si, meaning the fear of death. Kia Bo, fear of having nothing. Kia Cheng Hu, fear of government. And Kia Bor, meaning the fear of your wife. Fear Do you wife. hear me? Or no? The answer's no. <laughs> I think that's probably a good thing. I don't want you to be afraid of me. This is why Singaporeans are known for having two favorite pastimes, queuing and choping. They hate missing out. It is said that if there's a long line, it has to be for something good. You don't even <laughs> have to know what the line is for. Ooh, and just choke get into it. Uh -uh, nope. seat during meal times at restaurants. It's a mad dash. Every man and woman for themselves. To reserve a seat, people will usually place cheap personal items like a pack of tissue or a <laughs> pen to claim a table. We totally do that here due to the former colonial ties to the british you might notice much i'm not gonna lie like I, th when i was younger at like about 16 17 years old i truly had fomo yeah yeah like i hated it like if i was taking a nap or something or i, I didn't feel good or whatever the case may be and i get a call from my friends and they were like yeah we were gonna go did you want to go i would feel horrible and get up and go because i just didn't want to miss anything so yeah it's a weird sensation like you get angry if somebody does something without you you're just mm -hmm. like mad at them of Singaporean culture is anglicized. For example, many people may choose to give English first names to their children. In addition, much of the traditional architecture is a fusion that blends hints of British and Asia. None more exemplified better than the 20th century style Those shop house. These narrow structures are known for having covered walkways called five foot ways to help residents stay dry during the rain while shopping. Certain festivals are celebrated by everyone too, like the heritage and food festivals in July. I go there. Their version of Black Friday is called the Great Singapore Sale, where things go up to 70% off. I'd like that. And you can't forget their <laughs> national day, August 9th, commemorating their independence. Singapore also, in a way, has a culture a of appreciating mm -hmm. discipline. Crime rates are very low in Singapore, partially because ramifications can be severe and corporal punishment is common and accepted, even in schools. Sometimes Singapore wow. is called the fine city because you can get fines for certain things like, oh, I thought I meant fine, but fine. <laughs> you can get fines for eating or drinking on the MRT, playing loud, annoying music in public, chewing or selling gum, and Unless it's prescription. Also, wow. technically, Singapore does oh, yeah, not because have gums complete banned. freedom mm -hmm. of speech. Even when making debates at Speaker's Corner in Honglin Park, they must register the topic with the government prior to speaking and are still monitored. Nonetheless, the country moves forward pretty well, even amidst these seemingly harsh policies. They want to maintain order, and for them, the best way is to do it this way, the Singapore way. The one person that will never be in order is Keith. So here is Keith's music segment. Whee! Okay, disclaimer, yeah, he's by the definitely way, I love from Funky Florida. Dog. They're an amazing band. George Clinton is an amazing keyboard player. Due to fair use law, don't sue. That's my commentary. Goodbye. The music culture of Singapore <laughs> is special because it takes influences from the Chinese, Malays, and Indians. In the early 20th century, traditional Chinese street opera troops would set up and perform either in music clubs or during festivals. The art has declined in the past few decades, but you can still find some performances being done, especially at the Chinese opera Institute or the Chinese theater circle near downtown. For the Malay community, it's not uncommon to hear ensembles performances called Don Dong Sayan and Keron Jong. These are usually done at special events and weddings. For the Indian community, South Indian Raga ballads are not uncommon. And North Indian Bangra dances are usually seen at special events as well. In a more contemporary sense though, in the 1960s, they basically had a wannabes Beatles band, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Can't buy me love. <laughs> Just kidding. Kind of. Artists started to experiment <laughs> with bilingual lyrics and pop music in bands like Crescendos and October Cherries. For a while yeah, in the October 1980s Cherries. and 1990s, a new genre inspired by Taiwanese country music called Xingyao swept Singapore by storm. Today, pop music has become a more progressive genre with many artists singing in English. They even won the first and only season of, you know, Asian Idol. I could only imagine the hmm. Asian Simon Cowell. Ha ha. Recently, <laughs> many metal bands 
bands like Iron Maiden, Slayer, and Dream Theater have made Singapore a stop on international tours, which has led to a new interest in metal amongst the teenage angsty youth. In any case, the most important venue for musical that's performances today building. would be the Esplanade, located right wow, on that's cool Marina looking. Bay yeah. downtown. All right, that's it for me. My name is Keith, and as you can see, we have these wonderful Keith shirts. You can wear this shirt on a train and maybe that's even a, cool a plane. Shirt. Later! Thank you, Keith and Hannah. Whew. And now, famous people. We're just gonna kind of rush through this. Historical and political figures like these. There's a lot of actors like these. Remember Jet Li got citizenship. DJ hmm. Kygo was actually born here too. And for authors, you know, the guy who wrote Crazy Rich Asians. And there's a lot more. And speaking of crazy and rich and Asians, let's talk about Singapore's diplomatic outreach, shall we? Singapore. Sorry, we're not talking a lot. There's just so much information, and you gotta I mean, take it's it all. Such in. a different country. Yeah, like this is so unique on its own. So, Singapore has virtually no conflicts with any other country, and today they have diplomatic relations with 189 countries. For what's worth, though, they know how to play the global chessboard pretty well. For one, they are a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, which of course opens up their ties to 54 other nations across the world in shared cooperation treaties. Generally, other Anglophone nations get along with Singapore all around the world, from Africa to the Caribbean, back to Europe. This means, of course, that the UK is a close ally. They have a mutual defense agreement called the Five Power Defense Arrangement, which includes Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia. They are the fourth largest investor in business with high levels of stock ownership. Many Singaporeans also either study abroad in the UK or even have family and live in the UK. The USA is a huge partner with a free trade agreement and the military cooperates frequently. Singapore's Air Force has a detachment in Arizona's Luke Air Force Base and the I US Navy is allowed that. to use Singapore's ports. China and specifically Hong Kong are both very close friends, obviously as the majority of the population in Singapore are of Chinese descent, mostly of the southern parts of China like Fujian, Guangdong, and Hainan. None. Collectively, China and Hong Kong are also the largest trading partners, reaching about $100 billion in revenue. Nonetheless, relations wow. kind of fluctuate depending on how much interaction Singapore has with Taiwan. Singapore does have military facilities in Taiwan, and in 2004, they put bilateral relations on hold when the former prime minister took a private trip to Taipei. Hong Kong, though, is kind of like the cousin across the sea, as both were former UK colonies, and they have very similar structures in the way how they function with business and government. India, of course, is a close friend as well, not only due to the diaspora, for a population of Indians in Singapore, but with huge economic ties as well. In the 90s, India initiated the Look East policy, in which they decided to expand its commercial, cultural, and military ties to Southeast Asia. With the it seems as though Singapore is pretty much friendly with everyone. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what it's been saying. Yeah. That it's probably safe to say the closest countries to Singapore would probably be their fellow ASEAN members, more specifically Malaysia and Indonesia. Now with Indonesia and Malaysia, there is kind of like a sieged mentality of past unfavorable events, like the Borneo conflict of 63 that Singapore was kind of dragged into, but they've generally moved on and moved forward. All three countries operate along the Strait of Malacca, the busiest choke point of trade in the world, so they all kind of have to work mm. together. Indonesia is the third largest trading partner and in 2005 signed a memorandum of understanding. Lots of important resources come from Indonesia, and many Indonesians get along with the Malay Singaporeans as they have very similar cultures. Malaysia, on the other hand, is kind of like the divorced wife that decided to stay in a <laughs> business relationship. They are the second largest business partner. Each country is able to easily cross borders and immigrate. The Malays often have family on the other side and intermarry. Singaporeans love crossing into Johor to shop, where everything is like a quarter of the price it would be in Singapore. And overall, the awkwardness of the breakup is pretty much non-existent to this day. All three of these countries are solid together. But by the way, I just realized one of you guys sent me this hat. I should have worn it for the whole video. Oh, you guys should send us a hat. In Singapore, everything is <laughs> yeah. kind of about balancing, you know, infrastructure, nature, culture, and the future with the right amount of negotiation, compensation, and discipline. It's just kind of how they do things here. Stay tuned. Slovakia is coming up next. That's dope. That is uh, a ton of information we say this on on every geography now they just speak yeah. so fast and it's so much i mean this one was like even longer yeah this i think this is the longest if not almost the longest one we've done with geography now um it's gonna take a lot of studying and re-watching to learn all of these things yeah let us know what your favorite thing is about uh singapore if you live there let us know definitely down in the comments yeah I, we love knowing that we touched certain areas and they're just like, that's where I'm from or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So we love that guys. Again, if you enjoyed this video, give us a like, please. It helps out the YouTube algorithm to pass it out to a lot more people to see it. 
Um, also, if you want to see our future videos, please hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so you'll know when the next video drops. And of course, if you want to uh, support us directly, hit the join button and join our membership program. And with that being said, my name is Miles. And my name is Fez. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace. Out.